I'm Adi Lilmumni, Rheology Product Manager at TN Suites. I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. During the webinar, you can customize your viewing interface by arranging windows to your liking. You can resize the video and slide windows independently from one another by clicking and dragging the bottom right corner of each window. If you get disconnected at any time, please use the instructions you have received to log back in. You can access several different content windows by clicking the widget at the bottom of the screen. These include speaker bios and additional file downloads. If you need help, click the question mark widget. Please ask any questions you may have at any time during this presentation by submitting them through the Q&A window. We'll answer as many of these as possible at the end of the webinar. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Matthew Libertor. Dr. Matthew Libertor is an associate professor in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering at the Colorado School of Mines, where he has been on the faculty for nine years. He has earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Illinois at Chicago and master's and PhD degrees from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, all in chemical engineering. His current research involves the rheology of complex fluids, especially traditional and renewable energy fluids and materials, polymers and colloids. He has authored or co-authored over 50 peer-reviewed publications in the area of reoptics and scattering, high shear rheology and high pressure rheology. We're very happy to have Dr. Libertor speaking with us today. The title of his talk is High Pressure Rheology, Introduction and Applications. Matthew? Thank you, Adil. Today I'm going to cover the topic of pressure, high pressure rheology. And high pressure rheology is an interesting area and we're going to cover um, four different projects that we've worked on in this, uh, in this you know, area of, of rheology. Um, first, I want to uh, thank my students who have taken the data. So four students and a postdoc are listed under my name, and those are the ones who took the majority or almost all of those measurements that you'll see today. Our website is rheology.minds.edu, where you can find direct links to the publications and, and other work that we're doing in the lab. And finally, I want to thank our sponsors for this work and all of these projects that I'll, I'll talk about today and they include the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, National Renewable Energy Lab, and uh, uh, numerous industrial sponsors of the Center for Hydrate Research at um, the Colorado School of Mines. So the talk today will have four different components, four different pieces to the talk. First we'll talk about the pressure cell itself and how it works and, and what some of the limitations are and, and some of the bounds on using it. And then we'll talk about three, I think, important categories of using high pressure rheology, and those are volatility, saturation, and phase changes. And so we'll give a couple of examples in volatility, an example of saturation, an example of hydrates under the phase change. And so we'll jump right into that first segment. And so the advantages of high pressure rheology, I just listed them, volatility and saturation and phase changes. And so the volatility challenge here is related to um, getting the, uh, keeping one, the operator safe from volatile components that may come off, but also doing good and, and, and accurate and precise measurements. Um, not losing the vapor during a test, thus changing the concentration if it's a multi-phase fluid or something else. Under the next area of saturation, this is very commonly seen in, in, in different process units like reactors um, or in oil and gas pipelines where you have lighter components like methane saturating a, a liquid like a crude oil or an emulsion. And finally, looking into new phase space, we think about uh, phase diagrams, you usually think about temperature as one of, the, one of the axes. Here we can use both temperature and pressure to explore a new phase. Um, and so we'll talk about uh, clathrate hydrates and we'll also talk about um, something called a sugar glass early in the talk. And so the, this ability to control P and T can give you a new understanding and, and, and a new phase domain for multi-phase mixtures and other fluids. So we'll look at the pressure cell itself and some of the, its logistical makeup. Here we want to talk about some specifications including pressure and temperature. So you can work with the cell from atmospheric pressure in the sealed cell setting all the way up to 2000 PSI. And so we'll see lots of data here uh, in the second half of the talk between 1500 and 2000 PSI. Um, and the temperature range goes from negative 10 degrees C all the way to 150. Um, we'll see data today from 0 to 90 degrees C. We've gone down to minus 10. 
Um, and so there is a wide range of temperature space that we can work with. The shear rate range uh, covers about three decades from one reciprocal second to almost 1,400 reciprocal seconds. And I'll talk about how we got such a high shear rate in this pressure cell. So the picture on the left-hand side of the slide shows you the pressure cell installed on the rheometer. We can see the black jacket. That is the Peltier jacket that controls the temperature of the cell. Uh, the smaller black item above, above that is, is the outer magnet that rotates uh, the, the inner magnet and thus creating a shear field inside. The pressure gauge you see in the upper left of the picture is one of the out, um, uh, inlet outlet ports and there's a second one on the right hand side of the picture. We want to look at this in more detail. So here are some photographs we took and, and were published in one of our articles. We'll start on the right hand side looking again at the outer magnet and the inner cylinder and the outer cylinder, that same Peltier jacket. If we take a look, I have one here. This is the pressure cell itself. It's assembled here with the inner cylinder. I'm going to unscrew and take out. And the outer cylinder, the inner cylinder, I'm just going to unscrew and set aside for now and we'll get back to that in just a moment. Here we have a, two inlet ports, one on my left and one on my right. We have a pressure gauge on this right hand side. On the back we have a safety rupture disc and so that points to the back of the instrument and so that even if it, it ruptures it's not in danger of the operator. And finally we have these threads and this is what connects the inner, cell and the, uh, inner cylinder and the outer cylinder um, and then you see the, the cup that is inside. So that's the outer cylinder and we control the temperature from the outside of that. Here is the example of the inner cylinder. Here is the bob that we have. It has a conical bottom. And this is the part that rotates. It's, you, know, you can see the, the general size and the height here. This screws into this cap at the top. We have a, some threads here that, that connect it to the outer cylinder. We have a seal um, right here. We have another seal up at the top of the cell. Inside this part of the, of the cap is that four pole magnet that you can see in the upper left photograph on the slide. And so that gives you an idea of, of the relative size scale and how the cell actually goes together. So the cell holds about nine milliliters of sample in a, in a standard one millimeter concentric cylinder geometry. So we will show data today in the concentric cylinder geometry. Um, this is, is very useful, a, a wide range of, of both shear rates and, and viscosities we can look at using a concentric cylinder. Uh, geometry, the standard bob uh, leaves a one millimeter gap and we've built custom bob, I'll talk about with the biomass um, example a little later on. That smaller gap we were able to uh, um, access some higher shear rates. So the other type of geometry that, that we've built and, and we've tested but I'm not going to show any data today is a vein geometry. This is four pedal vein. Um, that's actually an excellent geometry and working with solid systems. We worked a lot in the ambient pressure setting working on a biomass solid system. And so this deals with loading issues in these high solids environments but also wall slip. And so those two types of geometries um, are, are available for use in the pressure cell. And so with that, I'll jump into the three different um, topics that I talked about earlier here. We're going to talk about volatility in terms of two different projects. First, biomass pyrolysis oil or bio oils, and secondly, sugar glasses. So um, let's introduce this idea of, of uh, biomass and biomass to fuels, a biorefinery here. We'll start on the left-hand side. We have two types of biomass. We have corn stover, we have poplar. Um, these are non-food uh, biomass uh, sources, we call that cellulosic biofuels. The top hand path in the green, you see the, the biochemical route or, or the sugar platform where you use enzymes to break down that biomass and turn it into sugar solutions. And then the sugar is converted into ethanol. This is a well-known process from beer making, that second step of turning sugars into ethanol. While taking uh, biomass and thermochemically converting it or heating it up or burning it, uh, is sometimes called the syngas platform and the fluid we're going to look at today is known as a bio oil or biomass pyrolysis oil. Pyrolysis is a process where we heat the biomass at higher temperatures on the order of 500 to 700 degrees C normally 
and we get this liquid phase that comes out that looks a lot like a crude oil, and so it's known as a bio-oil. And then we can convert that bio-oil into products like fuels or chemicals. So we're going to take that bio-oil and we're going to do something called accelerated aging in situ in the pressure uh, cell and then do some pressure rheology on it. So what are these bio-oils? They're, they're similar to crude oils in that they're made up of hundreds of different chemical components. Um, unlike most crude oils, bio-oils do have a large component that is water. Uh, that could be 5 up to 40 percent by weight uh, of water. These are thicker than, than water, um, hundreds of times thicker than water, so similar to crude oils that you may see. Um, but what happens is that when you create these bio-oils in the pyrolysis unit, um, you create um, some unreacted components, maybe some radicals and other things, and so the viscosity of these fluids change with time. And the time can be on the order of weeks or months where the viscosity is changing, and the viscosity changes at room temperature are quite significant. And so the Department of Energy has come up with what they call an accelerated aging um, kind of uh, procedure and criteria. And so normally you would seal different samples of bio oil into vials. We would put them in an oven at a certain temperature, 90 degrees C in this case. And by cooking that oil, you're taking that aging process and speeding it up. And so instead of the viscosity changes over months, now you're down to two hours. And so we'll, we'll compare this kind of standard uh, measurement that the Department of Energy set up at the certain time points and temperatures and do that all in situ in the pressureometer in a sealed cell. And so here's just some of the details. Here's where we did take that custom built uh, bob that we, that we made, had a much smaller, uh, half the size of the gap, one half millimeter. We were able to access higher shear rates then. 1375 reciprocal seconds was the highest shear rate we could do with this smaller gap setup. We used the pressure cell without pressure here, just a sealed cell, keeping those lighter components of the, of the bio oil in place. We took uh, the, the bio oil to up to 90 degrees C. We aged it anywhere from, from 8 to 24 hours, uh, three different time points we're going to look at, and then we took intermediate viscosities and final viscosities at room temperature. And so you'll see viscosities not only at 90 degrees C when the viscosity is quite low, but we'll also see some data at, back at 25 degrees C. So here's the first set of data I'm showing you taken in the pressure cell. This is, I think, some interesting uh, time-dependent data. So here we have viscosity and a log scale on the y-axis versus time being held at this hotter temperature that we're doing the aging at 90 degrees C. And so here are three different colors representing three different runs of the bio oil going from 8 and 16 and 24 hour runs. And we see that we're very close to the torque limit of the instrument. You see how low the viscosities are, about 1 times 10 to the minus 3 pascal seconds, or 1 centipoy. And you see that there's a little bit of variation in the samples for those first couple of hours. But after about 3 or 4 hours, we see pretty good quantitative agreement from run to run. And we see how the viscosity is increasing with time up to 24 hours. And we can take a simple exponential and predict that you know, we'll have 90 or 95 percent of that steady state viscosity value within three or four days. And so all of this data was taken at that highest uh, shear rate I talked about, 1375 reciprocal seconds. So this real-time data had never been taken on these biomass pyrolysis systems because we didn't have the ability to, one, get up to these high temperatures and shear rates uh, in, a, in a controlled manner like the pressure cell gives us. So looking at the, the viscosity data in a little more detail of this accelerated aging process, our initial viscosity at room temperature, 25 degrees C, um, 0 0.19 pascal seconds. While we look at the, the aging viscosity after 8, 16, and 24 hours at 90 C, we look at the viscosity change when we cool the sample back down to 25, so that's the y-axis here. We have four different sets of data along the x-axis, so we have aging under shear on the left. We have, um, those are three different um, loadings and measurements. We have measurement under shear 8 plus 8 plus 8, so we have 8 hours. We make intermediate measurements, do 8 more hours on the same sample, and do that a third time. And then finally, we have the um, 
a no shear setting in this pressure cell, 8 plus 8 plus 8. So those two are directly comparable. The middle two sets of data on the right-hand side, we have the quiescent aging, so the standard DOE protocol of using external uh, sealed vessels in an oven. And so you see the data, especially at the 8 and the 24 hour, are quite quantitatively in agreement between aging under shear, the far left-hand data, and the standard DOE protocol on the right-hand side of the quiescent aging. And so this was a good uh, way to show that if we do the aging properly in an oven and externally measure the viscosity, we get very close to the um, same data that we get in the pressure cell but we lose that information of getting the transient data and actually being able to do it in situ and knowing that we don't lose some of those volatile components. Okay, so that was the first example, looking at biomass pyrolysis oils. We'll look at volatility one more time in the area of what I call a sugar glass. So these are mixtures of surfactant, sugar, oil. Um, these complex glasses form these very small nanometer scale domains between the sugar and the liquid oil, uh, limonene, in, limonene in this case. Um, and it happens without mixing. And so the pictures on the top are from, are from the paper where you see over a few minutes that dissolution, that dissolving of, of the components, the sugar and the surfactant into the oil phase. And then you see the, the product glass in the far right hand picture. So these sugar glasses are quite interesting and we think they're gonna have some interesting applications in the future, including food and pharmaceuticals. So some of the data we took by sealing these into the pressure cell um, are given on this next slide where we have G prime and G double prime, the elastic and the viscous moduli, uh, on a log scale as a function of the frequency. Uh, we see the frequency is shifted by a shift factor A sub T. This is time temperature superposition data. So we have four different temperature sets of data and they overlay quite well. And this type of data was done in the sealed pressure cell and we needed to have that uh, ability to control because at, at the temperatures you're looking at here at somewhere between um, 60 and 90 degrees C, we do have, um, we do have a lot of trouble getting into this glass phase domain. And so this glass phase domain we need to control the pressure. We need to keep the, not necessarily control pressure, but we need to have the sealed cell so that the um, phase can form. So the phase envelope to get to the glass phase as opposed to other neighboring phases is quite difficult. And so what we learned from doing these, this time temperature superposition data is that the relaxation time of this fluid, this viscoelastic fluid is on the order of one second, but when we cool it down and we start to enter this glass phase, we go to thousands of seconds uh, for, for these materials. So we, we looked at two different examples now for using the sealed pressure cell to get um, viscoelastic or, or viscosity data that we couldn't uh, previously do in an ambient setting. So we'll move on to the second topic of interest, which is the saturation of fluids. The example here I'm going to give is, is uh, heavy crude oils uh, and saturating them with methane. So what is a heavy crude oil? There are quantitative definitions. I'm not going to cover those today, but what we want to think of as a heavy crude oil, a heavy oil is a highly viscous oil, a, a, a crude oil that's very viscous. There are a large amount of these heavy oils in the world. Some estimates have over 40% of the world's reserves are in this viscous or heavy oil region. And so when the viscosity is higher, um, both production and transport are gonna be different than in a standard light crude oil system. And so dealing with viscosity, understanding the viscosity are important for both of those issues. The picture on the right hand side comes from the University of Queensland, probably the most famous rheology experiment in the world, the pitch drop experiment. The uh, website is given at the bottom of the slide. Um, and I know recently in 2014, the uh, first drop was ever seen that has fallen over that course of that experiment. This is a very, very viscous, very um, uh, heavy oil. And so the oils we're gonna look at today um, come from the North Slope of Alaska. Um, BP gave us these samples. Um, they are from the Ugnu Formation. There's quite a bit of this Ugnu heavy oil, seven to 10 billion barrels are in place. And 
the production technique of interest um, in recent years has been this cold production. So we don't have to add steam, we don't have to heat it and drop that viscosity using temperature, but we want to cold produce it. But when we cold produce the sand, there is sand included with the heavy oil, um, and it's called a chops process. And so uh, the map on the right-hand side shows you um, Golden, Colorado, or Denver on the right-hand side, and the 3,600 miles up to the north slope of Alaska, and giving you a reference point of anchorage in Alaska. And so our motivation for using the pressure cell in this setting was to understand better what the viscosity of these heavy oils, they're quite high, but when it's in the reservoir, there are lighter components, and especially methane. Um, that's in the, in the fluids, is saturated in the fluids, and how does that affect the viscosity of these crude oils? And so we came up with a system to saturate these fluids, and we couldn't do it just with the pressure cell alone. So this schematic and animation gives us an idea of how to uh, do what we call a live oil experiment. And so we want to take uh, three different components, a mixing cell, a high pressure pump, and then finally the pressure cell that we talked about earlier in the talk and getting those pressurized saturated fluids into the rheometer and the rheometer pressure cell. So first of all, we look at the mixing cell. We saturate the green being a gas, methane in this case. We use a high speed mixer where we under turbulent flow saturate the fluid and we can monitor the pressure and things like that to see um, that the fluid is saturated with methane. Uh, we pump that methane saturated heavy oil into the pressure cell, and then we can move the temperature and change the shear rate and do our rheological measurements once we have that, what we're calling a live crude oil in the pressure cell. So what does the data look like? Um, here I'm going to give you several examples, and the first one being, okay, how does viscosity change with temperature? The temperature in the, of what we call a dead oil and an as-received oil, this is the oil that you get. Um, after it comes to the surface, there's no methane there. It's at ambient pressure. Um, the viscosity does change pretty dramatically with temperature. We see that the viscosity on the y-axis here is on a log scale, so it goes from on the order of about 600 pascal seconds down below one pascal second over about um, a 50 or 60 degree temperature change. While when we have a saturated fluid, there's 100% saturation in the green here. We call that the live oil. We're saturating with methane, pure methane here. We see we also see the temperature dependence is quite strong, where we have about a hundredfold decrease in the viscosity from about 20 pascal seconds to about two tenths, or even a little bit lower than that at the higher temperatures. So temperature does alter the viscosity quite a bit, two to three orders of magnitude. So what about pressure? So we look at viscosity on a log scale here. X-axis is the pressure in the cell going from ambient conditions or zero uh, all the way up to about 1,700 PSI. The black data are the dead oil. We're doing this at 10 degrees C, 283 degrees Kelvin, where the black data are we're saturating the fluid with methane in the headspace. The cold temperature diffusion will be small and we see that the viscosity actually increases by pressurizing that fluid. It goes up about twofold over that zero to about 1,700 PSI. But when we saturate the fluid, we do that externally, we get lots of methane into the, into the fluid, we, we see the opposite trend, we see what we expect, we see the viscosity goes down more than an order of magnitude, almost two orders of magnitude. The lighter component methane here mixes in with those higher carbon number higher molecular weight components, and that decreases the viscosity. And so we can quantify this pressure change and the temperature change as well in those first two slides. The, the shear rate dependent viscosity of live crude oils um, is not very interesting. It shows Newtonian data. You see very nice data set here. Um, what I want to point out here are, are a couple of things. We have viscosity in the log scale on the y-axis, shear rate in the log scale on the x-axis. Those are, it's a very common plot you see when doing rheology. Um, we see that there's no shear rate dependence at any temperature of these live oils. But, but this is seven, um, seven different sets of data at six temperatures, and this is one loading of the pressure cell. So we load it at 20 degrees C, approximately our lab temperature, and 1510 PSI. Here we would increase the temperature to 30, 40, up to 60. 
we see that the pressure changes along with the temperature since the cell is sealed. Um, there's no talking with the environment. It's a, it's a constant uh, volume measurement. So the pressure will go up if you increase the temperature. We go down all the way to zero degrees C, so the pressure goes down to 1400 PSI. And then we go back to 20 to see if there is any changes or history to this, this live oil that we're measuring here, and there isn't any. We see two different data sets at 20 degrees C overlaid. And so we can get lots of data. We have to put in a lot of effort to do that external saturation and load the cell properly, make sure it's sealed and it's holding pressure. And so getting lots of data like this at seven different temperatures for one loading is quite uh, a nice feature. And so uh, I want to sum up this portion of the talk by looking at viscosity again on a log scale. In this case, a 3D diagram where we have temperature and pressure on the two X ordinates. Um, and now we have this, this surface that is the viscosity uh, as a function of temperature and pressure for this Agnew heavy oil. The table on the right hand side gives you some common foods that, that give you some viscosity reference points. The highest point here um, are in the hundreds of Pascal seconds. That's at the coldest temperature and in no saturation. And so that's somewhere between peanut butter and shortening. While the lowest viscosity is at the higher temperatures, 60 degrees C, and the higher pressures below, uh, above 1500 PSI. And that uh, viscosity is on the order of a tenth of a Pascal second. And so that's on the order of the, the viscosity of olive oil. And so we've, we've uh, covered this whole range of pressures and temperatures. You see the gray lines going from the upper left to the lower right in the plot. Those are the kind of the, the isotherms, the temperature dependent, um, excuse me, those aren't isotherms, but they are the temperature dependent uh, data. Um, and you see those change uh, a couple of orders of magnitude while the black lines coming from um, the upper right to the lower left show you the pressure dependence of, of the viscosity. And so we're able to map the surface uh, of the heavy oil viscosity using the pressure cell and taking all of these data points and giving a good understanding no matter what pressure the reservoir or temperature the reservoir is at, we have a good understanding of what the viscosity is in that setting. So the last um, topic to explore is, is looking at new phase space. We did that once with the sugar glasses early in the talk in the sealed cell volatility portion. Now we're going to look at something called hydrates. So what are natural gas hydrates? They might be called clathrate hydrates. These are solid uh, water, ice-like crystals made of water that have a guest molecule um, inside of this water cage. And so on the right-hand side, you see a kind of a, a schematic diagram of these different cage structures that form around the guest and the different structures. And so they're commonly called structure one and structure two and structure H. Um, and, and we're not going to go into the details today, but that, that, that is what uh, makes up a hydrate uh, um, on the molecular scale. On the left-hand side, one of the more famous pictures of a hydrate, the burning snowball. And so this looks like a, a glass um, dish filled with, with ice, but you can light that ice on fire because these um, hydrates do hold quite a bit of methane, and obviously methane will burn quite easily. But in order to form these clathrate or natural gas methane hydrates, we need high pressures and low temperatures. And so we're able to do that only in a pressure cell setting for most um, guest molecules that hydrates form. There are some ambient pressure forming hydrates, but those are not as important for um, the oil and gas industry. So who cares other than the oil and gas industry about these hydrates? Um, not only do they form um, uh, in pipelines, uh, especially on, on seat floor and subsea oil and gas production, and the picture on the right gives you an example, another picture of hydrates coming from Petrobras. Um, the pig launcher, which is used to clean the pipeline, um, collected this very large hydrate deposit, which was clogging the pipeline. This is an issue for two reasons in an oil and gas pipeline setting. It's a safety issue because now you've created this solid aggregate, which could become a projectile if, if uh, dislodged and creating a safety issue and injuries and deaths could ensue. But also you're obviously not getting the oil and producing and getting your product out of the pipeline uh, if these form and block the pipeline. The other interesting area why people care about hydrates is as an energy source. So as I said, they can trap a lot of methane or other light hydrocarbons that we can use uh, as energy. And so there are, are countries like India and Japan that are looking into um, 
finding these are these are well known to be found along the, the uh, continental shelves along the coasts of some of these countries and so they've been looking at ways to try to produce this methane and these lighter hydrocarbons from those hydrates and so there's lots of interest in this hydrate area. The cartoons at the bottom of the slide um, give you an idea of what we're going to talk about over the next few slides looking at the data. We have a light blue oil phase uh, dark blue water phase, so we have a water in oil emulsion, the first picture. When we drop that temperature under the pressure, we can form either a slurry or a suspension. Those are the words we'll use. A suspension is where we convert all of the water into solid hydrate particles, so we'll call that a suspension, while a slurry would be where we convert most or some of the water into solid hydrates while some free water is remaining. We'll talk about the viscosity difference between the slurry and the suspension as we go along. So this is again a somewhat difficult process um, to make hydrates. It does take a, a good amount of attention to detail and we did come up with this um, experimental measurement system for the hydrates where we use the three components again, the mixing cell, this high pressure ISCO pump, and the, finally the pressure cell on the rheometer. So first of all, we make the emulsion. Uh, this may be just mixing uh, water into a crude oil where there's natural surfactants in place. This may be a more model system where we've used water, um, a, a simpler oil phase, maybe as simple as uh, just dodecane, and using a surfactant to emulsify the water. And so those details are available in the publications. I won't talk too much about that in the next few slides. Finally, we'll saturate the emulsion in step two. And then we have a, a, a multi-phase fluid that we can form hydrates out of, methane hydrates. And so we pump that saturated fluid into the pressure cell, we drop the temperature, and we form the hydrates and measure their properties. So this hydrate formation and hydrate rheology study has five different steps, and we'll cover data from all of them here today. This is a, a somewhat complicated diagram on the right where we have pressure, temperature, and viscosity on the three different y-axes, time on the x. And so we see the pressure and the temperature in the first, uh, first hour we drop those controllably. So uh, we do a very controlled temperature ramp to go from room temperature around 25 degrees C down to zero degrees C. We see the temperature doesn't change then for the next um, 24 hours. While the pressure is constant initially, and then there's a uh, pretty measurable decrease where there's a viscosity spike in the bottom. And so that pressure decrease and that increase in the viscosity um, indicate that we have hydrates being formed. And we see that the viscosity goes up at least tenfold when that happens. When that um, viscosity spike occurs, that's not necessarily the end of hydrate formation. We see that the viscosity can continue to increase, as we see here in the transient data at the bottom, while the pressure does continue to decrease in this water dodecane system. So that's not necessarily true for all the systems we saw, but that gives you one example of a transient hydrate formation. So now we'll step through um, some of the other steps that I'm, or all of the other steps I've listed here. Um, including hydrate um, annealing and yield stress measurements and flow curves. And finally, the dissociation step is more interesting than just melting the hydrates. So here's another um, formation, uh, set of formation data. We have viscosity uh, on the y-axis, time on the x, but now we've normalized time so that all of the measurements start at time zero is when the hydrate's nucleated. Nucleation being a stochastic process doesn't necessarily happen within minutes. It sometimes takes hours or many, many hours. Here are five different um, water cuts going from five uh, volume percent all the way up to 30 percent by volume. And you see we'll focus in on, on the three higher ones here, 20, 25, and 30. We see that their spikes initially are, are all quite similar, almost quantitatively the same. When that nucleation occurs, we get this uh, very similar spike in viscosity. But what we see is there's a quite a big difference between the 20% sample in blue, where the viscosity after the spike decreases and then levels off after about 10 hours, as opposed to the 30% water cut uh, sample, which has a, a, a pretty uh, good increase in the viscosity for the next about 8 to 10 hours before that viscosity starts to uh, decrease and then level off after more than 20 hours uh, after the initial nucleation event. And so um, what we um, hypothesize is happening is that these higher water cut systems have unconverted water 
which can then later um, get converted into additional hydrates, causing the second viscosity increase. So that, that next step in the process is we let the hydrates that have formed in this multiphase mixture now, we let it sit. Um, we're simulating what we call a shut-in or a stoppage of, a, of an oil pipeline. And after about eight hours, we um, start the flow. We do a, what's probably the most uh, popular way to measure uh, a yield stress, which is a stress ramp. Where here on the left-hand side, we have shear rate as a function of shear stress. And so we just ramp up the stress linearly until we hit the point where the sample begins to flow. In this case, the, the water and mineral oil emulsion example on the left at 1500 PSI has a uh, um, yield stress of about seven pascals. So not a very significant yield stress on the order of hundreds of pascals like you'd find for a toothpaste. Um, but it is a measurable value. On the right-hand side, we give a whole set of yield stress data for a water in West African crude oil emulsion. And we see that as we go up in water volume fraction from 20 to 45% water, we see that the yield stress goes from almost not measurable at 20% all the way up to, you know, on the order of 10 pascals at 45%. But all of a sudden, we increase the water uh, loading, the water cut um, from 45 to 50% and we cannot flow the suspension. The yield stress is greater than 3,000 pascals. This, I think, um, quantifies and, and really uh, hones in on one of the mysteries uh, and why hydrates are, are, are so, um, so heavily studied by what's known as a flow assurance engineer in the oil industry, is that this, this small change in water uh, cut causes this dramatic change in the hydrates and the flowability of that suspension. And so now we've kind of quantified this stress to, to break what we call a hydrate plug in a rheometer. So now we've, in the cases where we've broken the plug, we, um, we flow the suspension and let it come to kind of a steady state, and then we measure its non-Newtonian properties. And so in this case, unlike in the live crude oil, we have uh, strong non-Newtonian characters, including shear thinning. Here are four different water cuts for the four different colors plotting viscosity as a function of shear rate. And we see that um, the shear thinning is evident in all of the samples, and that in the blue and the green and the black, the higher water cuts, we have a, a, what looks like a zero shear rate plateau at low shear rates. We have uh, the viscosity leveling out in the hundreds of reciprocal seconds, the higher shear rates. We fit this using a cross model, and we can get a zero shear rate viscosity and infinite shear rate viscosity the thinning um, uh, and quantify the thinning. This is a water and dodecane system. We did see shear thinning in, in the other oil systems that we looked at also. And so these suspensions and slurries of hydrates that form do show non-Newtonian character also. And in an oil pipeline, as one example, the 10 to 100 reciprocal seconds is a, is a pretty common shear rate range seen in a pipe flow. So since we're talking about pressure rheology, I wanted to show data that, that look at how pressure changes the viscosity of the fluid. We talked about transient um, viscosity and hydrate formation early on. So here, that's what we have on the left-hand side for a water and dodecane emulsion. We see that the time after nucleation, we see that initial spike. And then at 1,000 PSI in blue versus 1,500 PSI in black, we see that after that initial spike, and the size of the initial spike does change with pressure. So you're going from a peak of a little less than one pascal second at 1,000 PSI to about 1,500, um, to about 1 1.5 pascal seconds at 1,500 PSI. So you see the transient behavior with less pressure, less saturation, most likely being that the viscosity is lower, less hydrates. On the right-hand side, after that suspension at 1,000 PSI or 1,500 PSI comes to some uh, steady value much later in the experiment, we see the, the, the red and the black data um, almost overlay. The red is slightly smaller. It's at the 1,000 PSI versus the black data at the 1,500 PSI. The non-Newtonian, the shear thinning character is the same. The viscosity is only slightly lower. Well, if you change the 1500 PSI sample by just 2 degrees C, we see that there's a much more measurable decrease in the viscosity. 
And so a two degree temperature change for these hydrates gives a much more significant viscosity change than a 500 PSI change in having the saturation of methane tuned with that pressure. And so the final step would be melting or dissociating those hydrates. And what we see, um, especially in the West African crude oil uh, emulsion, a water emulsified in that crude oil, um, when we plot viscosity as a function of temperature, that horizontal, or excuse me, that vertical red line um, gives us um, the thermodynamic equilibrium phase change temperature. And this data for four different water cuts um, going up to 45 volume percent. And we see at the higher, um, higher loadings, the 40 and 45 percent water, we see that the viscosity increases quite measurably before the hydrates um, completely break up and melt. And so this um, somewhat anomalous peak in the viscosity um, of the, what we consider partially melted hydrates is quite an interesting phenomena. And so that fact that we're getting this kind of pre-melting and likely a, a thin water layer on the hydrates causes a viscosity increase. So these partially melted hydrates are sticky. And there's been other hydrate measurements looking at the adhesion between two particles. And, and the adhesion is higher when there's a water layer on the surface of these ice-like hydrate particles. And so that gives you the story um, of forming and studying the non-Newtonian properties of hydrates over a whole wide range of, of pressures. Uh, water cuts, and, and a little bit with temperature. And so with that, I want to wrap up, talk about those three components once again. The first one being volatility, so keeping those solvents in place, not having them vented into the lab or having to have a secondary um, venting system for, for making rheology measurements, keeping the, the concentration constant where we could form that sugar glass phase, um, which we couldn't do in an ambient um, rheology setting because we would lose a little bit of that oil at the higher temperatures, it would volatilize and we would miss the glass phase envelope. And then we talked about saturation of fluids, looking at heavy crude oils, what we called live crude oil viscosity, and we were able to measure the viscosity as a function of both temperature and pressure and have that surface. And looking at viscosity changes on the order of two or three orders of magnitude by changing temperature and or pressure. And finally, we just wrapped up looking at uh, new phases being formed in the pressure cell because we could control at high pressure and then drop the temperature and get into the thermodynamically favorable region for forming these hydrate molecules, these ice-like aggregates. And so those were the four examples we gave and, and the, the three, um, I think, three reasons to um, do pressure rheology, volatility, saturation, and exploring new phase space. So with that, I want to wrap up and um, just list the publications here on the screen. The data I showed you today come from one of these uh, series of publications. Again, they are listed on my website at rheology.minds.edu. I know we'll be taking questions here uh, during the webinar, um, and I'm available for questions. Um, you can contact me through that website. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Matthew. A recorded version of this webinar will be archived and available online through the T-Instruments website.